Sepp is from the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, um, where he is working on uh, viral evolution as a group leader um, in the department of the epidemiology of highly pathogenic microorganisms. And well, as we all know, throughout the last three years, that is a quite an important field um, that impacts a lot of things. And um, so Sepp is from France, um, where he was um, moving from in 2010, I think, to Berlin. So he has been in Berlin for a long time. And before he was in Lyon and also working on uh, retroviruses and other questions. So generally his work is concerning the deep evolution of viruses and uh, bats, great apes, humans, uh, historical samples, present day samples, co-evolution. Uh, so really um, about all the different uh, viruses that are there and then that impact our lives and the ones the lives of our closest living relatives. So yeah, we're looking forward to your talk. Thanks for being here. Yeah, well, thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks uh, Martin, Verena and uh, Mev for proposing and organizing it. Really glad to be here. Um, yeah, so this talk will be about the origins of uh, human adapted pathogens, but a slight variation of the title that I actually sent, um, which is based on the distinction that, uh, that I like to make. I should mention that I'm presently at the Robert Koch Institute, but I'm in the process of transitioning to another institute called the Helmholtz Institute for One Health in Greifswald, that's on the Baltic coast in northern Germany. Uh, and, and because of that, I sort of have like a contractual uh, obligation to start with such a Venn diagram that recalls you that we live in very complex environments uh, where humans interact with a lot of different organisms, uh, notably animals, uh, and also with uh, whatever constitute the abiotic and biotic environment on top of animals. And in these environments, there are tons of microorganisms of all sorts. Uh, I'm interested in viruses, but also in bacteria, eukaryotic parasites, whatever. Uh, and there are plenty, right? And we know <clears throat> that from time to time, uh, some pathogens from or some microorganisms from the environment or from animal reservoir will jump into our own species uh, and uh, become emerging threats, right? And we actually know kind of a lot about these emerging pathogens, uh, which are just pathogens that reach human populations, but do not necessarily, uh, will not necessarily establish in our populations for the long term. And notably, something that we know because it's been studied for decades now is that uh, these emerging infection events uh, are dominated by zoonosis, and in particular, uh, by zoonosis originating in wildlife, okay? So we kind of know a lot about uh, all these bugs, you know. So, for example, I work also on Ebola or Lassa or things like that. They, they fit this kind of description. But at the same time, Ebola, Lassa, uh, and many other emerging threats uh, do not represent at all the majority of the burden uh, that infectious agents uh, are for human health globally, right? Those agents that actually represent much more of the overall burden are those that circulate permanently in humans, right? And those are human adapted pathogens, okay? They are in our populations, they stay in our populations. We cannot get rid of that, them naturally in most cases, so we'll have to intervene. And those guys are those that I will talk about today. And in particular, I will talk about uh, how we worked to try to unveil the origins of these human adapted pathogens. Of course, uh, it's absolutely obvious that they originate at some point in the past, right? And, and the question is to understand uh, when and where exactly. Knowing that, there are essentially two scenarios that one can think of. One is that these were previously emerging pathogens in ancient human populations, or that they've always been with us. A number of our pathogens infected our lineage and our species before we actually came to be a species of our own, right? I'm sorry. So should I say, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the thing is that it might be a bit surprising, but of the hundreds of pathogens that, that we know of today, the vast majority 
um, it's still very mysterious with this aspect. We don't know what are the origins of these pathogens. Very often, we are not even able to say whether these were pathogens that infected our species since forever, or if there were emerging pathogens. Even these like very basic building block, we don't have, right? And the large part of the of the work of uh, of our group is to try to understand these these origins and uh, to to build plausible evolutionary scenery so that we are able ultimately to tie up human ecology and evolution with the, the process of assembly of our pathobiome. Of course, there have been like many, many different notions and many different key facts that have been brought forth um, to try to link up, um, whoops, sorry, to try to link up, conceptually speaking at least, some important facts in our own evolution uh, and the, the, the rise of uh, some pathogens. So here I just pick three of these facts which are particularly prominent. Uh, you know that our closest relatives are African great apes, so gorillas, chimps, and bonobos. And of course, because we also know that uh, zoonotic uh, events are all the more likely that they happen between two very closely related species, we can assume that a number of our own pathogens stems, stem from transmissions from our closest relatives. We can also hypothesize that as we diverged more and more from them, these events became less and less frequent, right? If we move and have like a gigantic leap uh, forward towards our times, uh, when we started to domesticate animals, of course, we were in very close contact with a number of new species, and they certainly acted as very important reservoirs for new pathogens. And even later on, uh, when the structure of our populations and their distribution changed sensibly when, for example, large cities were first being built, we also, we also met new circumstances that would allow many pathogens to survive in our population, not only to enter them, but to persist in our populations. And today I will present um, three examples. Two of them um, pertain to these three uh, exemplary processes or events that I just mentioned, and they have to see with uh, two viruses, two sets of viruses. They are the simplex viruses and the measles virus. And then, of course, <clears throat> even closer from us, uh, there are like recent pandemics uh, about which we can learn a lot uh, using ancient specimens. I'm super happy to talk about kitchen and recipes, but uh, I, I will not give any real technical details today, right? I will just tell you the stories that derive from our analysis. What we do is grosso modo what you also do uh, for part, uh, which is evolutionary genomics, right? So basically we extract nucleic acids, we try to enrich them from time to time, depending on the topics and on the difficulty of what we want to explore. Then we use isoput sequencing to generate genomes and we use genomic variation to infer individual pathogen history, right? As you see, <clears throat> we work with uh, different kind of uh, samples. And I will start by briefly evoking what here I've called comparative approaches, which just means that uh, we use samples that require a cross spectrum of species, humans included, and uh, that we use to, to try to understand generally very deep events in our evolutionary story. I want to first briefly mention this kind of approach, first because they are very important approaches, of course, and second, because that's actually what I do 90% of my time. So using ancient samples is, uh, is, is, not, uh, is not what's, what's at really at the center of what we do as, a, as an institute either. So <laughs> when I, when I, when I when I talk of comparative approaches, we, we do have like sort of a specific focus on, on a group of animals. I, I mentioned already the African great apes, and we work, we've been working for more than 20 years uh, with different long-term primatology field sites, people that are interested in behavioral ecology, like Roman Wittig, 
uh, who was at the MPI EVA uh, until not so long ago and moved to, to France, to Lyon recently. He's the head of uh, the Thai chimpanzee project. It's a project of habituation of wild chimpanzees uh, in Cote d'Ivoire that has been ongoing since 1976 or seven. I don't remember exactly. And so we, what, what we do with that, basically we piggyback this kind of project and we, we send veterinarians. We, we always have a veterinarian on this particular project as well as on a number of other field sites. And they team up with a behavioral ecologist to collect uh, behavioral information, which can be useful for, for disease monitoring, because that's what we do, and also biological samples of different sorts. So this can be fecal samples, but also necropsy samples. I will show a little picture. Basically, what we do is that we try to collect any kind of information. So sometimes we use camera trapping, like, like is the case here. You will see a chimp. You see it's, it's not in a very good body condition. Uh, it's limping. There's severe halopecia. And you see this disfigurement. It's also not able to knock or walk like chimps usually do. Uh, this chimp has leprosy. So that's a project on which we worked with Verena uh, in the last couple of years. This is the kind of observation that we can make. I will not mention leprosy here, which is caused by bacterium. Um, but these kind of studies of current health of African great apes can actually enlighten the origins of human pathogens. So these cases of leprosy really, really helped us with this kind of um, speculations, so to say. And this is something that I do with Fabian Lendert, who is the founding director of this new institute I was mentioning in the beginning. Uh, Fabian is uh, sort of like the best vet in the world for these kind of things. Uh, he's, uh, he's an encyclopedia of what happens in African great apes. Not only, so we, I told you that we send veterinarians, so that's a typical example of a veterinarian when they're in a forest. We tell them, hey, you collect whatever. So if there's a dead elephant, you go in the dead elephant and you take whatever tissues you can take. So we try to have like this sort of um, overarching perspective on what happens in these ecosystems. And there are not so many teams of disease uh, ecologists that can be uh, deployed very fast in the field in Sub-Saharan Africa. So very often, we also team up with uh, WHO and big organizations like that. Uh, to lead or take part in um, outbreak investigations. For example, uh, when there's a new Ebola outbreak, we are usually part of this, of this kind of endeavors. So th th that's sort of what we do usually, right? And basically when, when Fabian recruited me uh, almost 15 years ago, he was already doing all that. Uh, and he was collecting tons and tons of samples. So we have a, we have a, quite a huge sample collection of probably something like 100,000 different samples from different individuals uh, collected over the years uh, with um, sometimes for ch some chimp populations, chimps for which we have even 400 or 500 samples collected in 25 years. Um, across many species, we have this kind of sample sets. And he wanted to make more of it uh, using evolutionary approaches. And that's, that's sort of my job. Okay, so I will first talk about herpes. Just maybe some, uh, some quick facts. Um, there are two herpes viruses that circulate in human populations. There is one that is responsible of the oral labial herpes and the other of the genital herpes, although now they, they tend to mix with one another, especially in the genital area. HSV1 is very common. Prevalence is about 50% in the overall population. Uh, HSV2 is actually pretty common too. Uh, it's about 10%, uh, but it's, it of course increases with, with age. There's no vaccine for HSVs, uh, but we have pretty decent antivirals. They're usually causing this sort of uh, cold sores uh, or blisters, which are extremely painful, I heard. Um, but sometimes they also generate uh, complications which are far from being negligible. For example, infection with HSV2 uh, increases the risk of HIV1 infection. And there are cases of uh, encephalitis, especially by neonates. 
something that is um, <clears throat> that is interesting from a, an evolutionary perspective that there are related simplex viruses in many vertebrates. In particular, if we focus on primates, uh, what we observe here, we have like two phylogenies. So the simplex virus phylogeny on the left side and the primate uh, phylogeny on the right side. And you see that, that in this tangogram, we do have mostly concordant phylogenies. They're not perfectly concordant, but we, don't, we also don't expect even when there is perfect co-divergence that there would be perfect concordance because we have exactly the same process, uh, processes as incomplete lineage sorting when you think about the circulation of viruses or pathogens in general across evolutionary timescales. So it seems that they frequently co-diverged. Of course, HSVs, they stand as, a, as an exception because the idea that these viruses co-diverge is largely based on the notion that only one of these viruses would, in, would infect each primate lineage, right? Just the fact that we have two HSVs is already an indication that there's something kind of weird happening. The closest relative uh, of these two HSVs is a, is a virus which is found in chimpanzees. And basically, that kind of gives the hint that, okay, these HSVs that we find in humans, uh, they are certainly originating in our lineage, and there's certainly one of them that is the original human herpes simplex virus. The problem is that we cannot really say which is which from these kind of uh, topologies. And a large part of the problem in our inability to say which is which uh, lies in the fact that we only have one chimpanzee, one African great ape, herpes virus. And so basically to, to try to solve this question, um, we decided to, um, to sample more across great apes. So we sampled in uh, all subspecies of uh, chimpanzees, uh, in bonobos, and in all subspecies of uh, gorillas as well, using fecal sampling. We also could, uh, could gather isolates uh, from uh, sub-Saharan African human, uh, human individuals. Uh, that we that we could sequence, and so we it was sort of a very tedious task. Um, a, a very large majority of the samples were negative, but we could uh, identify a total of seven samples from African great apes that were positive, and from one of them we could reconstruct a genome. It was the gorilla uh, herpes simplex. Oh no. Hmm. There's a missing slide, but it's not a problem. Okay, so basically <clears throat> what we did with this sequence then, and which is not apparent here because I accidentally deleted a slide, uh, is that um, we tried to estimate the divergent states uh, of different parts of the virus tree. To do that, we could not use any information from the viruses themselves because these viruses, they evolve way too slowly so that we could use the information at the tips to inform the rate over the entire phylogeny. So we had to use information that we obtained through another part of this simplex tree in the macaca part of the tree in which there is perfect co-divergence. And there is perfect co-divergence in this part of the virus tree. And we also know the dates uh, from a number of different studies when the macaque hosts actually diverged from one another, right? And that provided, a uh, that provided a, an opportunity to estimate uh, these node ages in the virus tree and then to compare them to the node ages that we knew from the same studies uh, that had been estimated for the hominine horse, right? And basically what you see here is that we have the root node of this virus tree that has a date which is very close to the divergence of all African great apes and humans, which is about 8 million years ago for this study, which seems to indicate then that HSV1 would be the virus that originally infected humans. And this date of divergence is basically the divergence from the gorilla virus. And then we see that for this other node that links together 
the human and uh, all the other African great apes. We have a divergence date, which is much more recent than the divergence date between humans and chimps, well, and the nines. And that means that whatever happens there was cross-species transmission. It's really not clear in which order we had cross-species transmission. It was from gorillas to other, well, to humans and benigns. We know it at some point. And then probably, or maybe, between human and bonobos. But it's not absolutely certain. So we, we, we need to, to obtain more sequences to be able to, to tell something like that, to, to identify the proper directionality. So here we have a case where, where we're really able to tell apart which one of two viruses are the human adapted viruses, the first human adapted viruses, virus, and then another one that was most probably a cross species transmission already a long time ago from our closest relatives, right? Okay, so now I, I will move to um, yeah, ancient uh, genomics, and in particular to museomics. And a very specific case of museomics, which is pathology collections. So we work also a bit with natural history collections, but much less frequently than with pathology collections. The first pathology collection that we, we worked with, and, and the two projects that I will mention now, are all based on samples from this collection, at least partly, is the collection housed at the Berlin Charité. So Charité is a big university medicine uh, in, in Germany. And it was very, very strong on pathology. Basically, pathology was co-invented there. Uh, at some point by uh, Rudolf Virchow at the end of the, the 19th century. And they have quite a big collection, more than 10,000 specimens, including about uh, 300 lungs. And I was very interested in um, respiratory diseases. We work a lot on respiratory diseases, also in great apes. So, uh, so I reached out to uh, Thomas, the, uh, the, the head of this, um, of this museum, and, and we started um, discussing a bit together. Thomas is a medical historian. And one cool thing with pathology collections is that not only do we get access to biological samples, we also get access to whatever other information has been preserved in the archives of a pathology department, usually. So here, for example, that's, that's the documentation that was part of the documentation we had for one of the measles cases we, we worked on. Sometimes it's interesting, in particular, to understand a bit better how former MDs understood uh, pathologies and diseases, right? These collections, they have a complicated history. Uh, in the first place, they completely fell in disarray in the last 30, 40 years. So I've been in touch with, I say, I would say a good hundred pathology collections worldwide. And it, it, it's happened to me more than once that people actually told me, yeah, until the late 70s, we had a huge collection, and then we just threw it away entirely, sometimes thousands and thousands of specimens. In the case of the Charité collection, it's a collection based in Berlin. And of course, although it was huge when the Second World War started, the Second World War um, resulted in the destruction of 95% of the collection. So we have a distribution of the, of the lung specimens which is very much skewed towards the 50s and the 60s. But we still have, like, grosso modo, 100 specimens pre-World War II for, just for lungs. Pathology specimens themselves, uh, they, they often present like that. So these are surprisingly uh, large specimens, right? So it's very, it's very usual to, to find whole lungs, for example. Sometimes you also have smaller ones. Sometimes you have formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue sections, which are like much more small. Uh, but, but this kind of, uh, of case is, is very frequent. They are formalin fixed. So that means that there will be macromolecular crosslinks, uh, which prevent many of our molecular biology reactions. And um, they also do not only contain formalin. Um, sometimes acids are added to the mix, and formalin anyway 
uh, is acidic. So there is the potential for much hydrolysis. And so fragmentation, deamination, depurination, everything usual with ancient stuff. But in comparison with classical ancient uh, material, they're pathological. We know 100% that this person died of a disease, right? That's like that. Otherwise, it would not be in a pathology collection. For most of the pathology collections, a majority of the specimens stem from infectious diseases. We know that too. Then that's not magical either. We very often do not know what specific agent caused the disease. Sometimes we know, like for measles uh, or for influenza that I will mention later. When we started, basically, there was this curious phenomenon that although everyone knew that it was to some extent possible to work with formalin fixed specimens, because people had already uh, generated ancient influenza sequences, for example, from such specimens, also because formalin fixed specimens are used by MDs on a routine basis. So when, when, when you're investigated for um, cancer and that people will run uh, large SNP arrays to uh, really characterize super well the kind of cancer that you have, um, they use FFP blocks, right? So, so it's, everybody knows that formalin fixed specimens work. But still, almost nobody uses it. And uh, so one, one of the big questions we had was, OK, so what's the quality of these specimens? And I can only tell you about the quality of the RNA in these specimens, especially for viruses, because these are the only targets that we addressed until now. But the quality is very good. It's much better than what you would find in nearly all ancient specimens. So here you see fragment size distribution for this specimen. Uh, the average fragment size is 130, 140. You see the damage, uh, the map damage analysis. There's no smiling. It's clean. It's totally clean. We have better specimens than that. Still super clean for damage, and with fragment size distributions, which can be pretty impressive. So this one, it's more like in the 230 average fragment length. And we identified fragments up to 800 nucleotides, right? So that's, that's pretty good samples in total. So they are clearly an interesting source and a mostly untapped source of information about uh, what happened in terms of infectious agents. Uh, in the last 200 centuries, that's of course a major limitation when you compare with uh, the kind of samples that you most often play with here, guys. Another kind of interesting hint that exists in the literature at the moment that maybe in these specimens, viral nucleic acids are somehow protected from degradation. So here, that's a, a little study that was published last year, which focused on uh, human papillomavirus. Uh, the, the type 16, which is the most carcinogenic one. And basically, what you see is what was obtained from samples that were kept for 15 years in storage or 85 years. You see human um, quant well, the quantification of human DNA here, here again, and here of the virus DNA. It's a DNA virus. And basically, what you see that human DNA really decreases by a lot in 70 years, and much more dramatically so than viral DNA, OK? And basically, with Verena, who was part also of uh, the 1918 flu um, study that I will present a bit later, uh, we, we could also show that we found things that are consistent with that when we look at 1918 flu specimens. So we generally have larger fragments for the virus than for the host. OK, so what did we do with that? So I will first present uh, a study on, uh, on measles. So measles is caused by a virus. It's a very common childhood disease. It's totally vaccine preventable, right? So we have a vaccine that has been in use for 60 years now. Uh, it's absolutely safe. And it's very important that people are vaccinated uh, with this guy, because measles is a very serious disease. Even in our countries, 
with very good public health system, we still have 0.1 to 0.3% of the cases that die of bronchopneumonia or encephalitis. And uh, we, on top of that, have 20% of all cases that end up at the hospital. Hmm? I should also mention that when you're infected with measles, measles, the measles virus will deplete your memory B cells. And the result is that you have sort of a reboot of your immune system. So if you've been exposed to respiratory agents before that, you will actually lose your memory of these first exposures. So you start again anew after you first get measles, after the only one you get measles, right? That's another excellent uh, reason to get vaccinated against measles. And it's still a major infectious disease. So basically, it's still killing tens of thousands of kids, almost kids, almost only kids, uh, even now. And it's been on the rise over the last uh, decade, basically. So you see, measles, we can vaccinate very nicely against measles because basically, once you've been trained, once you've trained your system once, uh, you, you will be totally immune to further infections. And that has an impact on the epidemiology of the disease which always came in waves, right? So basically there were like measles years and years without measles because you basically deplete your stock of kids that are available for the virus. Then you go through a through and then there are new kids, newborns, they're available for measles, we have a new wave. The waves have been becoming higher and higher. And right now, since during the pandemic, many people did not vaccinate their kids for measles, against measles, uh, the waves are even much higher, even in Europe. It's a virus that belongs to a large group, uh, which is called uh, the Paramyxoviridae. It's a group that mostly infects small mammals. So here we have bats in red, and we have rodents in blue, you see, a huge diversity. And we have a small group within this family, which is called the morbidly viruses, I would just show it on the, on the screen, actually. You see it's here, and this group infects lots of different things. Uh, dolphins, uh, or also that's cats, um, dogs, but also, if we zoom in, humans, cattle, uh, and sheep and goats, right? So the closest relative of measles virus is a virus that, is, that was called the Rinderpest virus, and that we eradicated through vaccination in cattle. And it's always been assumed that because of this proximity, although we don't have a nesting that would allow us to really say, OK, the directionality is unambiguous, um, measles originated in a transmission of the virus from cattle. We don't have much historical documentation about what was certainly a pandemic or a gigantic outbreak at the continental scale uh, when measles was introduced in human populations. But we can still sort of have educated guesses from what we know of the biology of measles today. So the first thing is that most likely, if it was a transmission from cattle to humans, it most likely happened after we started domesticating cattle. The second thing is that we can expect uh, that maybe this virus was transmitted on and off to humans, but for a long time, as our populations did not have a high enough density, the virus could not establish itself. That's for the same reason that I just mentioned, that once you've been infected, you cannot be infected anymore during your entire lifetime. So that means that the virus to circulate permanently in a population should always meet new susceptibles at a rate that allow it not to get extinct, right? So it needs big populations. We have a fairly good idea of the size of this population. Uh, we call that the critical community size uh, from natural experiments when the virus was introduced in islands. And we, we know that it needs a population of about a quarter to half a million people to circulate permanently. Below this threshold, it just gets extinct. So yeah, it looked like it would rather be towards uh, the antiquity. And from that point on, 
uh, rather than before, that uh, measles would, would have been introduced successfully in the population, in human populations. How can we address this kind of question? Um, well, with this kind of topology, what we can do is to try to estimate the time to the most recent common ancestor that correspond to this node. This time is the maximum age of measles, right? Measles has to have been introduced after this time. Many groups have tried to estimate this uh, TMRCA, uh, but it's proven especially difficult. Um, in particular, because of this phenomenon that I think most of you uh, probably know, which is the time dependency of molecular rates, right? So this phenomenon basically means that um, the, the evolutionary rate that you will estimate is dependent on your window of observation. The shorter the window of observation, the faster the rate that you estimate. If you use these short time windows, which is typically what we do when we do tip dating, and we do that with viruses, then you would use this estimate to extrapolate distant events in the past, and you will tend to underestimate their age systematically. To avoid doing that, you can do two things. You can play on the window of observation and try to maximize the time depth of your tip calibration, right? So you, you, you gather ancient specimens like that. You, you cover more of this graph. And then you can also use models that accommodate explicitly time-dependent selection, for example, in the case of measles. And that's exactly what we did. So basically, we, we the first time I went in the in this museum, I had like I, I knew the history of measles and and all these problems uh, to estimate this this TMRCA, but I, I really was not thinking of measles at all. We went in the basement; it was like not orderly like that at all. It was like a big mess, uh, and then we started looking through the different specimens and trying to identify things that could be cool, and we stumbled into these measles specimen, and I thought, wow. Real cool, we can try to use this one. Let's see if we find measles virus. And we did find measles virus. I said that I would not uh, really discuss uh, kitchen and recipe, but just to make it clear, in this case, we did not even need to enrich. And that's something that is very current with, very, um, very ordinary with um, pathology specimens. Uh, if you just do RNA-seq, you find the bug, right? And in that case, um, producing like a, a very moderate number of good quality reads, we were able to reconstruct the food genome. And we use this food genome as well as all food genomes that were available to run these kind of models that I was mentioning that account for this time dependency uh, of uh, evolutionary rates. And what we found with that was that the emergence in domestic animals uh, most probably happened 3000 years uh, before Christ, and that's the, the, the divergence of measles and rinderpest uh, happened in the 6th century uh, BCE. And that's really interesting because if on the same uh, chronology you superimpose the, the evolution of the size of the largest cities in the main regions of the world, you see that grosso modo, the time of measles emergence is the time when we see, well, the time of this divergence is the time when we see that the largest cities in these different regions actually crossed the population threshold for measles persistence, which is represented by this dashed line, right? So we have sort of like a co-occurrence of this divergence event and a major eco ecological turn uh, in human history, the rise of very large cities. Of course, as I mentioned, it's a maximum age estimate. So we cannot say that we pinpointed that emergence happened at that time, right? And that's actually efforts that are ongoing. We're trying to basically <coughs> cut this branch uh, as much as we can so that we can narrow down the window uh, of emergence. Okay, and that will be the, the, the last example that I will present today. It's about influenza. Again, some, some very quick facts. So influenza is caused by two different viruses, uh, influenza A and influenza B viruses. 
it's a very common winter disease in our northern hemisphere. Uh, there's an animal vaccine available. Uh, it works well, depending on seasons. Uh, it's always interesting to get vaccinated because it's a major infectious disease as well. It's responsible for a lot of deaths uh, each and every year, especially in the young ones and the elderly. Influenza A viruses, which are those that I will talk about right now, are well known to have wild birds as reservoir, right? So in wild birds, they are enteric agents. So they, are, they have a tropism for the gut of birds. And basically wild birds then very often get to transmit their influenza A viruses to our poultry and also to swine from time to time. And from time to time, we have one of these viruses that makes it into human populations. It can also be a direct transmission from wild birds. It's never excluded. Uh, and this transmission is the start of a new cycle uh, for, the, for the virus, and it, it, it usually coincides with a pandemic. Otherwise, once a pandemic event is done and the virus, the pandemic virus has become endemic, as is the case for SARS-CoV-2, which is not an influenza virus, but still pandemic one, uh, then you have seasonal flu that goes on and goes on and goes on, and that's the one we vaccinate against. There have been approximately one influenza A virus pandemic per generation since a century, since we can record. The largest of all was the 19 influenza pandemic. Uh, it infected at least 50% of mankind and probably killed 50 to 100 million people. It occurred in several phases. There was an early phase in spring, summer uh, 1918, where there was lots of flu, uh, but uh, MDs at the time were not totally convinced that there was something weird happening. Uh, but after the summer, basically, it started uh, gaining momentum, and there were two big winter waves uh, that killed uh, a lot of people. It was a very special pandemic in the sense that uh, when I told you that usually influenza viruses are especially severe for the young and the elderly, it was true for this one. But on top of that, people between their 20s and their 40s died a lot. So we had, instead of a U shape for the fatality rate, we had a W shape, which is something pretty rare. We don't know much about the virus for the good reason that at the time, it was not even certain that a virus was the causative agent. People were still hesitating and considering different possibilities that a bacterium would be the causative agent, that a virus would be, or that a combination of both. And actually the first influenza A virus that was isolated was not isolated before 15 years after the pandemic. So we, we basically have no information about the virus itself, or at least we did not have until some people started playing with ancient specimens. And these are some of these ancient formalin fixed specimens that I was mentioning that had been played with since the mid nineties and, and delivered a lot of information, but somehow nobody really followed up on these kind of studies. We have two genomes for this pandemic that affected um, at least 500 million people. So just to, just to contrast with SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 this morning, we, we had more than 14 million genomes, right? So of course, it's, it's, it's an incredible paucity of information to, to derive uh, any information. We have information from these two genomes as well as from a handful of partial uh, hemagglutin in sequences. It's one of the genes of the virus. In particular, we know that it's a H1N1 subtype so there are subtypes of these viruses. Usually a pandemic is started by a new subtype uh, entering the population. And the subtype is defined by two of the segments, two of the genes uh, in, in the genomes of, the, uh, of, this, of these bugs. In the same collection that, uh, that, that I presented you earlier in the Berlin Charité Museum, we found these three specimens. and had all been sampled during the, during the pandemic. We also tried with a number of other specimens from the same collection, as well as from the Narentum with Verena. 
uh, but unfortunately we, we could not succeed in these cases. So here you see the genome-wide information that we could gather for the three specimens that we analyzed. They are the ones with these green shades here, right? These two orange are the two other genomes available. For one of these genomes, uh, we, we have the best genome available. So there was never such a good genome generated for 1918 flu. For the others, we have one that is pretty well covered and another one for which we have information here and there, but not so much. We could come back to uh, many questions about, uh, about the pandemic, just adding this, uh, this, this little information. In particular, we could ask questions about uh, how the virus did spread. And we were in the position to, 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 to prove that uh, there was very frequent intercontinental spread. So we, we know that because for the hemagglutinin in segments for which there were a number of sequences, uh, about 20 of them, um, we were able to reconstruct phylogenies that showed clearly that some European samples, which are here, the German ones, and here a sample from London, formed robust clads relatively robust clad, uh, with American ones, right? And so that, that clearly indicates that there was mixing. It's not surprising, of course, it was the end of World War I, so um, lots of people moving around, but it's still like a formal proof of the, of the process. Another thing that we could uh, investigate, because we had dates, exact dates for most of the specimens, uh, is whether there was persistence uh, throughout the pandemic of different lineages, like we've seen, for example, with SARS-CoV-2, with some lineages persisting for, for quite a long time. And indeed, that's what we see. We see that um, a number of well-supported lineages persisted across the different waves. Of course, a big question is also that of adaptation. So we have a new virus that comes from birds, enters humans, what happens? Uh, it's, of course, also very difficult to uh, tackle these kind of questions with five genomes. Uh, but still, we had two of the genomes that you see here that are marked in June 1918 uh, that were from the pre-pandemic wave, so the one that was a bit neglected at the time. So we could compare them to the others. And what we saw were, in particular, two polymorphisms in the nuclear protein, which correspond to two amino acid changes which have been very well characterized by modern influenza virologists uh, as being associated to resistance to one of the human antivirals that specifically target influenza, MXA. So at these two positions, we see bird-like residues. So it looks like a bird influenza for the pre-pandemic viruses. For the second wave, uh, we see the residues we usually see in human infecting viruses. So a signal for early adaptation. Another thing that we can do with viruses, which is pretty cool, is that uh, we, can, we can move towards functional genomics a bit, right? Uh, and in that case, we did not uh, resuscitate the virus, which has been done once, uh, but um, it's, I mean, it, you, you can imagine, so this was done during the pandemic, so you can imagine resuscitating a pandemic virus during the pandemic, etc. It was, it was sort of like a bit complicated to, to justify. So we just used one uh, activity, one enzymatic activity, which we can reconstruct in vitro uh, to, to just ask a very simple question. Okay, so for the two very good genomes that we have, one from North America and the one that I mentioned in the beginning, the very good one that we generated, for this specific enzymatic activity, do we have any evidence that we have different phenotypes? The two enzymes have different performances in vitro. And that's what we find. So basically you see the, the orange and the, and the green lines, uh, they, they, they reflect different activities. One is slightly more efficient uh, at its job, right? And then we pinpoint it by swapping the different segments which one of the segment exactly is responsible for that. I should mention that when I say we, it's not in my lab, it's in the lab of a, of a very good friend, Thorsten Wolf, who's, um, who's an influenza virologist. 
And finally, another thing that we could investigate was how uh, 1918 flu evolved towards endemicity. So after uh, the pandemic, there was a seasonal virus that went on and persisted in populations, in human populations, for more than 30 years huh? until the next pandemic, basically. And actually, the next pandemic in the, at the, in the late 50s borrowed elements of this virus. And the pandemic after that borrowed again elements from this virus. So it, it's, it's persisting until now, the 1918 flu. One observation that we made, which was really puzzling at the time, but then actually the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic sort of uh, cast a new light for us on, on, on this, uh, was that we observed that when we looked at the rates in the phylogeny of the, of the, of the pandemic virus, which is shown here, and the rate on the branch leading to the seasonal virus, which is shown here, and here for each segment of the virus, there are eight of them, we saw that the rate for the, that on the branch that led to the seasonal virus was much higher, right? So we have a rate acceleration following the pandemic leading to the seasonal flu with a stronger effect on surface proteins, so on maglutinin and neuraminidase, which are on the left side. And it's actually very much reminiscent of what we see with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic as well, for which most of the variants, Omicron in particular, um, have experienced a massive acceleration of their evolutionary rate, and particularly in spike. So, I've usually been very reluctant to, to, to drawing too many parallels between pandemics because, you know, different viruses, different human populations, everything different. But somehow, with time passing by, I feel more and more comfortable saying, okay, pandemic events, there are still something special, right? The scale is special. The speed at which the scale is reached is special. There are things that maybe are way more expected to happen during a pandemic than they are at any other moment. And basically, all these points that I just mentioned are things which are shared between the 19, 1918 influenza pandemic and the COVID-19 one. So of course, that's also something that we are investigating at the moment, whether this is this kind of signals we can replicate in other pandemics. So basically, the pandemics, the flu pandemics from the late 50s and late 60s. Um, yeah, for the moment, we don't have data. We're just going through samples. Okay, and uh, yeah, I would just wrap up. Going back to the uh, chronologies that I showed in the beginning, I just took these three examples um, about herpes, about measles, and about the 1918 flu pandemic, just to illustrate the fact that, okay, yeah, when we do these kind of studies, we can actually tie up the evolution of viruses with important uh, aspects of our evolution and ecology, right? And basically what, what our lab um, ambitions to do uh, is to move towards much more complete models of pathobiomass MV. So basically the idea is just to multiply the examples, right? And to have like, at the same time, a qualitative view, what happens with RNA viruses when you compare that to DNA viruses or to bacteria, gram-negative, gram-positive, whatever, but also a quantitative view, okay? So, for example, we can make the kind of hypothesis that many of the emerging pathogens uh, since the Neolithic would correspond to these green arrows and would be RNA viruses, right? Because it seems that the conditions for permanent circulation of many of these viruses only existed in them. And so that's what, what our institute will be working on notably. Uh, I would like to acknowledge Fabian, the, the, the head of the institute and a very supportive and a super nice boss. Um, also two colleagues, Livia, who spearheaded the 1918 flu study, and Ari, who spearheaded the, the measles study. Uh, there are staff scientists with us. And now, so really lucky to have them. And then colleagues uh, that have worked with us on, on this project, Joe for the happy study, Philippe Lemay is one of the best developers and always super, a super nice guy to work with, uh, lots of crazy ideas. Uh, and Verena, um, who worked with us on the 1918 flu in this case, but we work 
frequently together on, on other stuff as well. I'll be moving to Greifswald soon and, uh, and uh, we, we will be hiring. So if ever any of you feel like it, uh, just, uh, just drop me a line. And with that, I thank you for your attention and the nice invitation again.